Hello, you! Welcome back. Yes, you. I'm talking about you. And you, and you, and you for pretty much everyone who's watching this episode. Welcome back, guys. Uh, we have another episode of The Daily Show. Um, this episode is for October 26th. And what do you know? We are almost done <laughs> with October. Uh, there's only, what, three more days before our Halloween party. Two more days for our raffle. And I know you guys are getting excited, but we'll get there, you know, we'll get there. Don't get too excited. Um, anyways, we'll talk about another uh, stuff again. Like I said, another episode of The Daily Show. For today, we'll talk about... Um, oh, yeah, today we have more than three observants we'll be focusing on. You know, um, I'm not going to have any uh, um, other notable observances. Instead, we're going to have more than three that we can talk about for today. It's probably going to be a long episode, so bear with me. Um, starting off with Howling at the Moon. Yes, that's one observance. And then we'll talk about mules. You guys are familiar with mules? Um, but if not, uh, don't worry, we'll talk about it today anyway. So, <laughs> And then, I know we discussed uh, pumpkins in, uh, in one of our episodes like Planet of the Day. I think I've showcased pumpkin already. But today though, it's it's... The pumpkin's official observance so uh that's why we're going to be talking about that again that plant um and then we'll talk about chicken fried steak Ooh, wow i'm not sure if you guys already had your breakfast or you're eating it um you're eating lunchtime you're having your lunch right now while watching it or probably dinner you know and then for today in history we'll talk about whitney houston's first number one hit now uh, while we're not discussing it yet, maybe uh, you can come think of uh, which of which of Whitney Houston's um, song was it that that became the or her first number one, and then we'll travel to Samoa and talk about their national symbols. And as usual, we got our mini theme for the stuff of the day. So with that said, let's dive right into it. Today's observance. That's our start as always. Okay, so we have worldwide, right there, worldwide Howl at the Moon Night. Alright, so if ever this would be the first observance that is something you could celebrate at night. Like you have to wait uh, until it's nighttime or evening before you're able to, I guess, celebrate this observance. And yeah, it's howling at the moon or... Howling at the Moon Night, coming less than a week before Halloween. Um, worldwide, Howl at the Moon Night celebrates wolves, animals that typically howl at the moon. You know, like, especially the movies, or basically in rea uh, realistically, uh, when they howl, they kind of look up, right? And if you're in the right angle, it kind of, sh it kind of looks like they're howling at the moon. That's where the, um, the phrase came from. Um, it is a day to educate people about wolves and raise awareness to help groups that work in wolf conversation. Um, just like any other animals, wolves are also threatened by or getting endangered uh, through the loss of their habitat or, and or being hunted. Um, such as Wolf Haven. So Wolf Haven is kind of like a, a wolf con conservation. I almost said conversation. <laughs> conservation. It is also a day when people go out and take this observance literally howl at the moon. Uh, wolves have been associated with the moon for centuries, uh, going all the way back to the Stone Age. Uh, Greek and Roman gods and goddesses were also known for keeping wolves with them. Uh, wolves really don't howl at the moon though. Uh, like I said, you know, it kind of only looks like that when you're looking at, the, uh, at a specific angle, you know. What they do when they howl is they communicate. That's their form of communication, you know. They communicate with other wolves in their pack. And uh, they hold their heads up towards the uh, sky so that their howls carry longer distances. That's the reason why they're looking up when they howl. Um, if there are no trees, their howls can carry about 10 miles. Wow. That's pretty awesome. And, of course, you know, especially in the movies... They kind of uh, a, a wolf's howl has a connotation of of something scary or eerie, 
So yeah, there you go. Again, um, two ways you can um, what do you call this? Uh, 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 two ways you can celebrate this observance. Uh, you can learn more about the wolf, which I would suggest. You know, um, or or slash and you can kind of take this observance literally and howl at the moon <laughs> at night. But uh, be warned though, your friends or family might find it a little weird. So I would just stick to like learning more about the wolves. All right. Next up, we have another animal for today. The mule. There you go. Today is National Mule Day. So this day, October 26, was chosen for the holiday because it was the date in 1785 when the first Spanish donkeys came to the United States. Uh, arriving in Boston as a gift uh, from King Charles III of Spain. It was from these two uh, donkeys that George Washington... Oh, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me. Uh, bred what were the first mules of their kind in the United States. Uh, the talk of national holiday in 1985 was significant because it was the uh, bicentennial year of the arrival of the donkeys. However, um, a day devoted to mules had already been listed in Chase's annual events on the date for 28 years. Since the year they began publishing, uh, William D. Chase, who was editor of the publication, wrote a letter to the editor of the New York Times saying such a holiday already existed, which was called Mule Day USA. And that, even without the government's blessing, a holiday honoring mules and marking the anniversary of the uh, arrival of the Spanish donkeys uh, could be observed. So. Talking about the animal itself, the mule, it's a hybrid animal. It's the offspring of a donkey or jack. Um, jack is a male donkey and a female horse, which is a, also called a mare. Um, a similar animal is a hinny, which is the offspring of a female donkey and a male horse. So mules are almost always sterile because uh, chromosomal pairing rarely happens when they attempt to mate since they have an odd number of chromosomes. Now, um, <clears throat> all kinds of horses are used to breed mules, uh, with draft horses being used to breed heavyweight mules. The height, neck, or neck length, uh, tail appearance, coloration, and hindquarters of a mule are characteristic of those of a horse, while their limbs, hooves, and manes are characteristic of donkeys. Um, when was it? I think I showcased... Oh yeah, as an animal of the day, we talked about the donkey. And then, a few more episodes back, or a lot of more episodes back, I did showcase a horse as another animal of the day, and now we have the combination of both right there. Um, so, going back in time, in history, mules were first bred in an area that is now part of Turkey, which was known as Paphlagonia. I hope I pronounced that right. And then in ancient Egypt, Greece, and Rome, where they were used as pack animals, kind of like donkeys, you know. I mean, and, and horses. They were also associated with royalty and nobility in manly, or manly, <laughs> in many early societies. Columbus brought donkeys and horses to the New World in 1495 and was the first to breed them there. Although mules, we're in the area that was uh, the United States before 1785. It was on today's date in that year that Spanish donkeys arrived and George Washington became the first mule breeder in the country by using them. So this is pretty interesting because it's, you know, mule is generally also part of the uh, American history, you know. And this is a perfect day for you guys to learn more about mules. So first, we got the wolf, right? The uh, howling at night um, observance, where you can also uh, spend time to learn more about wolves. Now, another animal that you might want to spend uh, learning about would be mules. So if you have any spare time today, you know, another animal that you can look up to, um, mule. So there you go. Oh. Speaking of which, right, uh, mule and I guess horses and donkeys, you know, 
um, why we domesticate them is for them to help us with our things, luggage and stuff, right? So, especially horses, um, we use them uh, not just for riding. Oh, well, yeah, it is mainly for riding. Um, especially we have uh, like those external parts that we that we uh, have them pull, which are called uh, carriage, right? Um, but for this third observance, we're going to talk about a carriage that doesn't have any horses. There you go. It's literally named Horseless Carriage Day. Now, what is a Horseless Carriage Day? <clears throat> it's kind of, if you're not familiar with the term, it kind of sounds weird because when you say a carriage, you're supposed to have, you know, an animal. Uh, spe- uh, mainly a horse to pull the carriage. So how is it going to work? Well, the Horseless carriage is actually an early name for a motor car or automobile so before the word car uh, has become a thing a a lot of people were calling it horseless carriage back in the day so prior to the invention of the motor car carriages were usually pulled by animals typically horses right Uh, the term can be compared to other transitional terms such as wireless phone yeah Uh, which is, you know, a cell phone. A cell phone is a wireless phone. So a car or an automobile is a horseless carriage. (laughs) There you go. Um, Many of the first horseless carriages um, include tiller steering, an engine under the floorboard, and a high center of gravity. In the 19th century, steam engines became a primary source of power for railway, railway, locomotives, and ships. And for powering processes, in fixed installations such as factories. Then in 1803, what is said to have been the first horseless carriage, um, I'm getting my tongue twisted, uh, was a steam-driven vehicle demonstrated in London, uh, England by Richard Trevithick. There you go, Trevithick, I think that's his last name. And then in the 1820s, Goldsworthy Gurney built steam-powered road vehicles. Uh, one has survived to be on display at Glasgow Museum of Transport. There you go. Um, in the United States, a four-wheel steam carriage was made by Sylvester H. Roper in 1863. So, I-, I guess for today, there's a lot of things that you can try to learn about. So, we got two animals. This one doesn't include any animals. It's a car, you know. Before, um, <clears throat> before uh, Ford actually invented or came up with the idea of assembly uh, assembly line uh, in building a car you know uh, if you move further back in time you're gonna be seeing like those kinds right there right there uh, it kind of it is a car right <laughs> but it's it, it's still a carriage because if you look at the wheel like the wheel is kind of like a wheel of four carriage now cars have like better tires it's rubber and of course, like the engine is better, and uh, yeah, everything like that. All right, next up we have <clears throat> pumpkin. There we go. We're back to talking about pumpkin. So today is National Pumpkin Day, and again, obviously, it celebrates this amazing uh, fruit. Yes, it is a fruit. It's actually uh, uh, what do you call this? A squash. There you go. <clears throat> Its name is derived from the Greek word pepon, which means large melon. Uh, I, I, I mean, I guess I can see why it's usually called large me- melon. So yeah, pumpkins have long been, long since been associated with the harvest season and both Halloween and Thanksgiving. And guess what? Uh, what the observance is or what the holiday is coming in three days? You know, the Halloween. Or, well, more than three days. I I guess three days for us because we're not going to see each other in the weekend, right? Uh, During Halloween, many people pick or buy pumpkins. Most most often, the Connecticut field pumpkin and carve them into jack-o'-lanterns. Vegetables such as turnips have long been carved in Ireland and Britain. And the practice of carving pumpkins into jack-o'-lanterns stem from the story of Stingy Jacks. Um, so pumpkins were one of the squashes long eaten by Native Americans going back in history, uh, which they introduced to Europeans shortly after the settlers arrived in the Americas. In fact, 
pumpkin pie was served at one of the pilgrims' first Thanksgiving in the early 1620s and is now a staple of Thanksgiving meals. Like, uh, you know, uh, pumpkins is as important as turkeys, especially on Thanksgiving, I'm just saying. A smaller strain of the Connecticut field pumpkin, the small sugar pumpkin, is often used for pumpkin pie. But most Americans buy pie filling or puree in cans instead of getting it from fresh pumpkins. Although most Americans only use fresh pumpkins for carving, um, there has been a growing interest in pumpkin flavored foods in recent years. I mean, pumpkin spice latte, right? Uh, I know one of our students, if you're watching this, I'm talking about you. Uh, oh, it's right here. It's in my, uh, what do you call it? It's in my script, actually. Uh, which can be attributed to Starbucks' introduction of pumpkin spice latte in 2003. Oops, there you go. So we got pumpkin. So far, how many uh, observers did we talk already? Talk about already. I think there's four already. We got two animals, one horseless carriage, one pumpkin. We still have one more. We still have one more today. Um, and it's called the Texas Chicken Fried Steak Day. There you go. While there is a debate as to if chicken fried steak got its start in Texas, the holiday Texas Chicken Fried Steak Day, this one, definitely began there. Uh, the day stemmed from efforts undertaken by Jeffrey Yarbrough. Yarbrough, a public relations worker based in Dallas and a former president of the Texas Restaurant Association, thought there should be a day devoted to chicken fried steak uh, in the state, given the food's long history in the state as well as its popularity there. You know? um, <clears throat> so a bill was passed in Texas House in 2011 with Sheffield... Sheffield's backing. So Sheffield is. I'm trying to look at my information here. There you go. A state representative. His full name is Ralph Sheffield. Or it, it could be Sheffield. Yeah. You know. um, anyways, uh, with the backing which designated October 26th as Texas Chicken Fried Steak Day, the day has become known informally simply as Chicken Fried Steak Day. Restaurants throughout Texas mark the day with special deals and other activities such as giving a portion of their sales revenue from the day to a charity. Ooh, that's good. Or other community organizations. The day has spread to be celebrated at restaurants in other states also and by people across the country. So when we talk about the food, if you're not familiar with the dish, then you might get confused of its name because it says chicken fried steak right like chicken fried steak so you're talking about like two kinds of meat the chicken and the steak <laughs> so the thing though is the dish does actually does not include chicken in its recipe uh chicken fried steak i almost got it wrong chicken fried steak got its name around the uh, mid 1900s because it's prepared the same way as fried chicken with both egg and flour uh, for the breading so it's a steak but the way it's prepared is kind of like getting or preparing fried chicken that's why it's called chicken fried steak uh, chicken fried steak is also considered to be prim primarily a Texas dish but it's also popular in Arkansas, Missouri and Oklahoma this dish uh, consists of beef coated in batter and breading that is then fried have various ways to make it the meat used often from tough cuts and scrawny little cutlets and are used uh, but prime beef or choice cuts like tenderloin may be used as well um, the steak is usually first pounded so that it is tenderized um, it may be dipped in buttermilk and then floured uh, seasonings are usually added and the steak may be given an egg wash So however you make it though gotta make sure that you prepare it like a fried chicken. That's why it's called um, Chicken fried steak right there um, something similar to it. I think the only difference is the uh, um, the, 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 the the coating that is used is country fried steak there you go they are very they are very similar to each other but 
they still have a difference and i believe that is the uh, the coating uh that you use to kind of seal the the, the state uh see there you go we got like five observances for today um so feel free to celebrate any of those or maybe all of them if you can moving on to today in history we'll talk about whitney houston's first number one hit there you go oh, so if you guys were thinking about a song well there you go it's already revealed uh that song was saving all my love for you uh, this actually happened in 1985 which was two years before i was born um the ballad saving all my love for you was the second single from whitney houston following you give good love which peaked at number three on the pop charts in July 1985. Uh, released as a single in August 1985, this song eventually earned Whitney Houston a 1986 Grammy Award for Best Female Pop Vocal Performance. When the next two singles from her debut album, How Will I Know and Greatest Love of All, also topped the pop chart or pop charts, that sounded like pop tarts, <laughs> pop charts in early 1986. Uh, a 23-year-old Whitney Houston at that time uh, she was 23 years old, established herself as one of the biggest names in popular music. And we just showcased her in our uh, uh, musical artist of the day, right? For like a few months before. And you guys are very famili familiar with a lot of her songs. So, And then next up, we have in 2001, uh, George W. Bush signs the Patriot Act. So the USA Patriot Act, as it is officially known, um, well, I was going to tell you, it's an acronym. So the word USA Patriot actually, each letter from the USA Patriot actually means something. And it means, it, again, it's an acronym. It means uniting and strengthening America, that's USA part, by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism wow that is whoever named this act i just want to say that's genius right there it's a usa patriot right and then what it means is uniting and strengthening america against terrorism it it, it the, the meaning is like pretty awesome and then the 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 acronym actually made it usa patriot it's that's genius that's genius right there uh, Bush hoped the uh, bipartisan legislation would empower law enforcement and intelligence agencies to prevent future terrorist attack here on American soil. Um, the law was intended in Bush's words to, and I quote, enhance the penalties that will fall on terrorists or anyone who helps them. The act increased intelligence agencies' ability to share information and lifted restriction on communication surveillance. Uh, law enforcement officials were given broader mandates to fight financial counterfeiting, uh, smuggling, and money laundering schemes that funded terrorists. The Patriot Act's expanded definition of terrorism also, also gave the FBI uh, increased powers to access personal information such as medical and financial records. Um, the Patriot Act superseded, or the Patriot Act superseded the state law. Um, <clears throat> so we have a few notable figures born today let's go ahead and start with the first one jackie coogan 1914 um he was born in los angeles california and he's an american actor famously known for his character i forgot his name but he was in adam's family there you go he was also uh in the kid and oliver twist and then after that we have Pat Sajak right there, 1946. Pat Sajak. We all we all know him as the host of uh, uh, Wheel of Fortune. There you go. Um, in 1983, Wheel of Fortune became a syndicated evening program. It has remained on the air continuously since that time, with Pat Sajak and his partner Vanna White as co-hosts. And then we have Keith Urban. There you go. Keith Urban was born in New Zealand 
Uh, and then he grew up in Australia where he released his first solo album in 1991. Uh, by the way, he was born in 1967. There you go. Um, Urban has on to release a number of successful albums, including the crossover album Defying Gravity in 2009, which went to number one on the Billboard 200 albums chart. So yeah, there you have it. Those are all the things um, that we talked about today for Today in History together with notable figures born today. Now moving on to plays of the week, uh, we'll talk about Samoa. Let's start off with their animal, uh, national animal. So the uh, tooth-billed pigeon, uh, nicknamed the little dodo. This bird, this pigeon, is one of the closest living relatives to the iconic extinct dodo. Wow, that's that's pretty amazing. Um, unfortunately, this species is on the verge of extinction too. Now that is not amazing. They come from the family consisting of some 310 species of pigeon and dove. Um, it is found in the primary forests of Samoa, where huge areas have been destroyed to make way for agriculture. Now. Again, you know, this this kind of uh, human actions, unfortunately, is making a lot of species get threatened to extinction. And uh, I think we should not. I think we should realize uh, when to stop. You know, um, destroying destroying uh, a lot of habitats for these animals. Um, the good thing though is hunting the tooth-billed pigeon is now prohibited. Um, but annual hunts in the past have been responsible for the deaths of thousands of um, the birds. Um, the species is highly secretive and had not been sighted for several years until December 2013 during surveys of Savai. Surveys of remote areas are needed to locate undiscovered pockets of individuals and remaining habitat needs to be effectively protected i really hope they you know they they uh they stay with us for longer and again i got one thing to i mean i guess one problematic thing about them also is they're very secretive they're kind of hard to to be found so um you know like we we haven't seen one until december 2013 I mean, I didn't say, but like researchers. So, but yeah, um, again, we got to do our best to um, protect their habitat. I mean, we are kind of like on the top of the food chain, right? So we should know better. We should be more responsible instead of instead of uh, uh, basically messing the habitat of a lot of animals. So there you go. Next would be their national flower. And it's called uh, Tiuwila. Yeah, Tiuwila. Uh, in English, it's called red ginger. Um, its color is its most significant aspect because the Tiuwila is um, an incredibly vibrant red flower. Now, red is the most traditional color in Samoa and has some very important symbolism in Samoan culture, which is why it is one of uh, the national colors and probably the most important one. Um, it is associated, or the color red is associated with the sun and fire, which are important sources of life and power. Uh, Teyu wheel of flowers can vary from lighter shades of pink to bold red shades. And then for the traditional sport, we have the Kilikiti. Did I say that right? Kilikiti, yes. Okay, so Kilikiti is one of several forms of a uh, game of cricket, which obviously originated in Samoa. Um, it spread throughout Polynesia and can now be found around the world in areas with strong Polynesian population. Um, the game is the national sport of Samoa and is played in many other Pacific countries, including amongst the Pacific Islander diaspora in New Zealand or diaspora. Um, well, the rules of Kilikiti are flexible. Indeed, the uh, majority of reports written on the game simply say that the rules can only be known by those playing. Um, as for the similarities to cricket, because again, it's kind of like a, a branch of cricket, right? There is a batting team, a fielding team, and a pitch. Um, the ball alternates between two bowlers, um, one at each end of the pitch accordingly, 
there are two wicket keepers. Um, this as opposed to a single wicket keeper in cricket. So that's, uh, I would say that's kind of like one major difference between a cricket and the uh, kilikiti. And there you have it. Those are national symbols in Samoa. All right, here we go to our stuff of the day. We have a dog in Disney. Um, Mickey's favorite dog, Pluto. We'll talk about Pluto today. And Pluto is a type or a breed of dog which is called a bloodhound. Um, officially a dog of mixed breed. He was later, or Pluto, was later confirmed to be a bloodhound um, after making his first appearance in the 1930s Mickey Mouse cartoon, The Chain Gap. And I want you guys to kind of like look at Pluto right now, you know, try to, uh, Im uh, I guess, memorize what he looks like because we're going to compare what he looks like to an actual bloodhound, which is this. Ta da! There you go. So you can still, if you guys can uh, visualize what Pluto looks like right now, you can see similarities on the long ear, right? Um, bloodhounds are known as sleuth hounds throughout the world, boasting an impressive sense of smell that allows them to track scent trails extremely well. Um, for this reason, they have been used by law enforcement to track down criminals and have been shown in this capacity in film and TV. Even though bloodhounds are typically docile and easygoing, they are relentless in tracking a scent. So that is pretty cool. Um, the bloodhounds can get pretty big, uh, reaching 23 to 27 inches at the shoulder and weighing up to 110 pounds. Uh, this makes them one of the larger breeds on the canine size scale. And then some of their well-known physical features include long floppy ears, just like Pluto, right? Wrinkled snouts and with loose skin. Okay, now this is not something that is... I guess I mean Pluto doesn't have really that that wrinkled skin. Let's let's go back to our picture real quick, right there. The only wrinkly part I see from Pluto is the nose, right there. You know, between the nose and the eyes, which I think this picture of a dog has too. But um, I guess the reality is bloodhounds have a, a more wrinkles in their face too. Um, additionally, they have powerful legs. Uh, which allows them to follow scents over miles of difficult uh, terrain. Um, bloodhounds are pack dogs, which makes them enjoy the company of other dogs and people. Normally easygoing and laid back, their noses can sometimes get get them into trouble when they poke around where they shouldn't. Oh man. <laughs> Alright, let's move on to our plan of the day fall version and we call it the million bells right there this warm weather plant is grown as an annual in most climates this profuse bloomer produces flowers that resemble small petunias um, to which it is related and holds up well as the weather cools in the fall million bells is more often grown in containers than in garden soil it has a mounting habit that works well in conjunction with trailing plants in mixed hanging baskets or large containers. And then moving on to our musical artist of the day, still Rick Astley. Uh, we're kind of going further back in time. I, you know, at least for until now, all the um, the songs I featured about or from Mr. Astley was somewhere around 2016 to 2018, right? So now we're just kind of uh, go back further, 2010. It, it's still recent compared to like the, his 1980s uh, hits, right? So, Lights Out by Rick Astley, 2010. Uh, this is a pop song performed by Mr. Astley. Uh, it was his first mainstream single in the UK for nearly 17 years. Uh, the song was performed to an audience for the first time on Peter Kay's 2010 tour, which commenced at the uh, Man Arena. Manchester on 27th of April 2010. Uh, Rick Astley was unveiled as a surprise special guest and performance and performed a medley of his old hits before revealing his new song. There we go. And then for our word of the day, we have a 10 letter word for October, insulation. 
right there. Insulation. It's spelled as I N S U L A T I O N. That should be 10 letters right there. It's a noun and it means the action of covering, line, or separating with a material that prevents or reduce the passage, transfer, or leakage of heat, electricity, or sound. So, there you go. And um, if you know someone who is an architect or who builds houses and buildings, then yeah, this is a very common term for, for them. Houses should have insulation for heat, um, electricity, and maybe some studios will have some insulation for sound. There you go. Oh, I'm, I'm talking about music studio. So. And last part of our show for today, we have Tech Trivia. Did you guys know that a Nintendo Game Boy actually went to space? Yes. Wow. I wonder where that Game Boy is now, or is it still working? <laughs> but anyways, in 1993, a Soviet cosmonaut brought his Nintendo Game Boy to space on the TM-17 space mission. You know, because, I don't know, maybe he likes to play Space Invaders. But <laughs> I'm kidding, guys. Well, I mean, what what else would you? I mean, would you play Super Mario in space? That's kind of weird. Uh, I would I would say Space Invader would be or Space Invaders would be the perfect game when you're out there in space. Um, anyways, it is said to have orbited Earth three thousand times, and the thing is, they got it back. Okay, it was later auctioned for. $1,220 for a Game Boy that orbited Earth 3,000 times. Um, I don't know. It's amazing. <laughs> that's, uh, that's an amazing thing to see. The, uh, the problem, though, is I don't have extra cash to buy it. If ever, I'll just you know enjoy learning about it. Uh, I don't know if it's already in the museum, but apparently someone might have bought it in an auction. So... I just want to know if it's still working. Because that would be awesome if it's still working, right? So, yeah, there you have it, guys. That's our show for today. Thank you so much for sticking with me. It wasn't really that long of an episode. I thought it's going to turn into a long episode. But we made it in about a little bit past half an hour. Um, again, um, I hope you like it. I hope you learned something new. Um, don't forget to leave your thoughts about the topics we discussed in the comment section below. And I'll see you guys next time i'll see you one more before we do the uh, whole um, i guess raffle thing and our um halloween party that is coming pretty soon pretty soon so yeah there you go um but for now um thank you so much and i'll see you guys next time bye